Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the House Appropriations Capital Budget Subcommittee, first one of the legislative session. This afternoon, we are joined by the Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, Chairman Ben Barnes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for being here. And we will start off with the Capital Fiscal Briefing presented by Mr. Matthew Fine. Fine? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the interest of time, because I know you've got a long agenda, I am going to start on page five. Um, the first few pages of this are essentially an executive summary. Uh, so I'll start on page five and page six, which highlight the fiscal 24 capital program and compare that to the capital program for fiscal 2023, as well as what was programmed for fiscal 2024 in the last session's CIP. And overall, you'll see that the capital program is down about $1.65 billion relative to last year. And while that looks like it's not a good thing, um, I would remind the committee that fiscal 23 was a historic budget over $5.275 billion. It had never been seen before. Um, and the budget for fiscal 24 is slightly higher than fiscal 2022, which at the time was also an historic high. And I'll get it, I'll show you a chart later that illustrates that. So again, $1.65 billion less, but still a billion more than what was planned for fiscal 24 in the 2022 session CIP. And that's reflected in the red, blue, and yellow lines, the red line obviously being fiscal 2023. A couple things to pull from this. First is the spending affordability limitation or recommendation for geo bond limits. Um, the geo bond limit is a billion two hundred five, um, which is consistent with what the spending affordability committee had recommended for the twenty twenty three session. But the administration is holding the line on any increase in the geo bond limit. Um, spending affordability committee had recommended a four percent annual growth. Um, on an annual basis after fiscal 2024, and the administration is holding the line on geo bond authorizations. And this is really in recognition of the fact that the state's fiscal situation allows for a much more expanded use of general funds. So the decision is to use the general funds to try to hold the line on increasing our debts. And so you see that in general funds. Uh, you see the historic level of general funds in fiscal 2023. And the 2024 number of $807 million, that again, it seems little, but I will say that prior to fiscal 2022, when we authorized a little over $500 million of general funds to support the capital program, for the 10 years prior to that, the total did not exceed the $800 million that's being authorized, being recommended for fiscal 2024, just to give you some magnitude. The increase in special funds is primarily attributable to the Fiscal Responsibility Fund. There's $310 million from that. It's going to be applied to K-12 through education and some higher education components as well. And you'll also then see a change in federal funds. There's a big drop relative to fiscal 2023. That's because the funds that came in through ARPA are expiring. They are, however, being somewhat replaced by funds from the IIJ um, Federal Infrastructure Act. Um, which are going to be actually began in fiscal 2022, um, but those limit those the that authorization level is less than what the American Recovery had brought in, which was used predominantly to support the broad expansion of the broadband, um, as well as the Healthy Schools Program and the School Construction Program, is where the state had put most of the ARPA money for capital. Page six just gives you an illustration of how this breaks down into the components of the budget, um, various set sectors of the budget. Uh, I would say that, you know, the areas that you're going to see the most change in the environment, again, everything's going to be down relative to last year um, because of the substantial reduction, but up relative to the CIP. And in the environment, increased spending is really supported by the federal IAJ money, as well as the parks legislation passed last year, which adds additional funds into the FY24 budget. In education, uh, again, a historic level for education last year, especially when you include the Built to Learn program. And there's still a very high level. $1.1 billion would be the third highest level of funding ever for school construction if you count Built to Learn. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I'd also like to highlight local projects, 700 and 
$28 million in FY23. This is something that's not usually programmed in the CIP. So you can see almost none was programmed in the CIP. And the budget includes $378 million uh, for fiscal 24, including $100 million that remains unearmarked and available for the legislature to allocate. Pages 7 and 8 begin to get into a comparison of the last year's CIP to this year's CIP, so you can look at it beyond just one year and what's happening over the four years in which the CIP overlaps. Almost two billion more programmed in the CIP over the next four years. Of course, a billion of that is in fiscal 2024 alone. On page eight, you see some of the areas in which you're seeing growth um, relative uh, to last year's CIP. Again, local projects, all of that growth is in FY24. Again, because nothing really gets programmed for that. In housing and community development, uh, the overall budget is higher than what was programmed in the CIP because the budget is going to continue the core project core in Baltimore City, um, which is expected to expire in fiscal 2023, and the CIP programs that through the five years of the CIP. Education, again, additional funding, fiscal responsibility fund is a big component, which adds to the additional funding there. And in the environment, the Federal Infrastructure Act, as well as the Parks Bill. Again, all things, uh, most of the growth is in fiscal 24, a billion of the two billion. Page nine, just to give you some perspective of the magnitude of the budget. Um, this goes all the way back to 2020. Through 2020, the program was hovering below $2 billion. It had reached $2 billion level in 2021. And then you see an expansion of the program, not only Built to Learn, which is the orange bar there, which adds a significant amount of revenue bonds um, that are being issued uh, by the Maryland Stadium Authority for school construction projects. But even absent that, you see a substantial growth in the tw fiscal 2022 budget. And this coincides with uh, a change in the fiscal situation which came about in March of 2021 when the revenues were written up substantially and remain pretty remain strong. And so the decision was to again uh, use additional general funds. And so over 500 million of general funds were brought in in supplemental budget to boost the fiscal 2022 budget. And then the historic level of funding in fiscal 2023 which the 2022 was considered historic at the time to then be um, passed by fiscal 2023. And while the fiscal 2024 budget is a reduction over last year, it is still greater than the fiscal 2022 and almost double what the capital program had been prior to fiscal 2022. On page 10, we get into some of the broader policy areas. And this starts with you know, strong revenues and the impact on affordability. Um, the state's revenue situation has, and has allowed the, the state to essentially hold the line on debt, and it has improved our debt affordability ratios, projected to go below 6%. And prior to fiscal 2022, the um, debt service to revenue affordability ratio was in excess of 7%. Now, this, this, the state's strong fiscal position, again, is allowed for growth in general funds. So if on page 12, you see what's happening with the GEO bonds as well as the um, general funds, and the blue line representing the GEO. And you see a, an increase in 21 and 22. Well, this includes bond premiums. The bond premiums are essentially um, bond proceeds. And so when you include the bond premiums in 2021 and 2022, something the state had increasingly used, Roughly 680 million was authorized in bond premiums between 2021 and 2023. I'll touch on the impact of um, the current fiscal situation and rising interest rates on why bond premiums are not materializing. But you did, you, you were seeing growth in the bond author, in the level of bonds being authorized, the amount of bond proceeds, I should say, because of the bond premiums. And then you see in 2022 the rise in the use of general funds. And in fact, general funds have almost doubled um, in 2023 budget the amount that was applied um, in GO bond funds. Uh, first time ever that general funds have superseded 
uh, the amount of GEO bond funds. And they're still projecting relatively strong use of general funds through the CIP. Again, the $807 million this year, and you can see the out years at, on average, about $550 million, which is also an increase over what was projected last year. And last year's CIP was the first CIP that had really projected any broad use of, of general funds in recognition of the state's fiscal condition. On page 13, um, while the revenue picture is good, there are some re other ramifications which are a little bit negative, and that is rising interest rates. Interest rates um, affect the um, bond premiums that we collect on our bonds, and we've gotten used to using bond premiums over the last few years, over $680 million over the last few years in bond premiums. But as interest rates are rising, the um, collection of bond premiums is, gonna, is expected to go down. There's an inverse relationship between interest rates and bond premiums. In fact, so much so that the $260 million of bond premiums authorized last year are not expected to materialize. Right now, there's only $40 million that is being booked in bond premiums for fiscal 2023. And that's resulting in a $219 million deficiency in general funds in this year's budget for fiscal 2023. So that the projects that were projects and programs that were authorized last year will have a source of funding and will not be interrupted. Rising interest rates also impact sensitive authorizations, authorizations where the amount of debt service is fixed. Um, the biggest impact here is in built-to-learn estimates. Um, when the program was established, there were some estimates that suggested the program would produce $2 billion. But this is all dependent on the bonds that will be issued, the timing of the bonds when they're issued, and the interest rate environment in which those bonds are going to be issued. And the bonds are only going to be issued when the projects are ready and the expenditures are expected to take place in a relatively short order. And with the rising interest rates, the expectation um, of what we might be able to get through the $100 million of debt service for Built to Learn is it's potentially going to be below the $2 billion level. And you can see an estimate of what different interest rates could mean to the amount that the Built to Learn bonds would generate. But again, this is all highly dependent upon the timing of the issuances. Uh, and we'll only know when we go to the market exactly how much that program is going to be able to produce. You heard me talk over the last couple of years, and certainly in SAC, about the impact of construction inflation. You can see on page 15 that construction inflation was 9.6%, which is relatively high in 2020. And then with the pandemic um, and the and disruption of the supply chain, um, you began to see that rise even more to roughly 14% and now 20% in 2022. This is an average annual increase of 14% over the last three years. And so what you're going to hear in, in the analysis is a lot of discussion about why projects are costing more than were estimated last year. Now, I just want to touch a bit on, on cost estimating. You know, the state does provide, it does use professional services to estimate the cost of projects that we program in the CIP. But of course, there are estimates. Until projects are fully programmed and scoped out, and then until you finally get through the design phase, you really don't know what the cost of a project is going to be. So we do, we use inflation factors to try to capture what we think those costs will be so that we've got good estimates and we can program those in. But ultimately, when you go to the market, that's going to determine what a project's going to cost. And one thing of note here is that the, the escalation rates used by DBM have been substantially below the current, um, the current inflation rates in the Baltimore region. Now, one reason for that is that, you know, there is a desire to try to hold contractors and agencies to, a, a, to an estimate for a project. And if they were to just jack up the escalation rates, that would not provide necessarily the proper incentive um, to keep projects within the original budget and scope. Next section deals with school construction. Again, you can see the historic level of funding and the impact of Built to Learn. But even before Built to Learn, the program was roughly at about $400 million prior um, to 2022, which was the goal that was established. The goal now is $450 million. And you see in 2023 a substantial increase, even without Built to Learn, 
Um, there's a focus on school construction in last year's budget. It was a heavy emphasis of the budget committees, and they had, particularly when they added a block grant of roughly $270 million to the jurisdictions. And one of the things that's helping bolster the school construction program in fiscal 2024 is the availability of the, fis the fiscal responsibility funds. Again, the level of funding, even without Built to Learn, is the second highest level of funding and well in excess of the, the goal of $450 million. Next page, page 18, this gets into a little bit on higher education. Um, again, the story with most things is less than 23, but more than what's programmed in 2024. The budget does not include, though, uh, an enhancement for facility renewal, which is something the Spending Affordability Committee had, had recommended in the 2021 and the 2022 Spending Affordability Committee reports. Um, you can see on page 19, um, just focusing on the USM facility renewal program, the CIP program is $75 million less than what was programmed last year. And another concern here is that it still includes $75 million of USM plant funds, which we've suggested um, may not be forthcoming from system. They may not be able to provide those funds to support that program in the out years. There's none programmed in 2024, so it's not really an issue for this year. But certainly when looking at the CIP, um, that could potentially be a problem. And we've pointed this out over the last couple of years, the availability of the plant funds. The one year they did authorize it, um, in fiscal 2021, they ended up canceling that and replacing those funds with bond premiums and a deficiency. So we still have some questions about whether those funds will actually materialize and be able to, USM will actually contribute that. Page 20 just gives you a perspective on how USM funds facility um, maintenance and renewal. And a couple things I wanted to point out. You see the purple, the purple line the purple segment of the bars, that is what they contribute operationally at the institutional level. But the hash purple line, that's added in because that's, that's that much more that they contributed than was originally budgeted. So every year, USM is budgeted a certain amount, and in fact, they contribute significantly more in their own in their own funding at the institutional level. And then the red bar, that shows the impact of projects that you fund in the CIP. Because every time you fund a project in the CIP to do a replacement building, ultimately that is pulling projects off of the facility renewal list. And as you see on page 21, that impacts the facility condition index, um, which is now the measure that the system is using, uh, which is a good measure. We're glad that they're using facility condition indexing and that they're using professional services at the institutional level to um, try to ascertain what those facility condition indexes would be. As a point of note, high, high, in high index, high percentages, that's bad, low percentages are good, so we're looking for those percentages to get lower. Also, facility renewal, DGS, another focus on uh, this by the Spending Affordability Committee the last couple of years. And while we've seen some improvement in the backlog relative to last year, as illustrated in 2022, and on the good side, there was virtually no projects that would be considered, um, you know, high risk of failure of litigation or premature deterioration of the asset. There's still a relatively high amount of facility renewal backlog. We really need to get DGS to the point where they're being able to encumber about $40 million a year at least to be able to actually whittle away that facility renewal backlog in any meaningful way. It's only been in the last two years that DGS has been able to actually manage $30 million in encumbrances. Prior to that, they had only been averaging about $17 million. And they've got new systems and new people, and that's beginning to help. Um, but we still need to, to get you know, the, the operation of DGS up to the point where they're able to encumber about $40 million to really have a reasonable impact on that. The next section deals with transportation. Um, the one take from here on page 24 is that the capital program has increasingly been used to fund transportation items which otherwise would have been, you know, funded out of the, the transportation trust fund. Uh, the WMATA grants have been a significant component. The state's contribution to the Howard Street Tunnel over and above the hundred and the, the two hundred 
$2 million. The state plans to contribute $124 million of that is in bond funds. Um, some of that is programmed beyond 2024 because of the cash flows of the project. There's a little highlight of that on page 25. But I'd also mention that the budget includes an earmark in the revenue stabilization count of $500 million for transportation projects. I'm not going to cover page 26. That just illustrates what's going on with the with how the state has been funding the WMATA grants and how it's programmed in the out years, um, all with general funds. Page 27 in the environment, just to highlight on the transfer tax revenues. Um, I've included both the, the December. I've included the December 2020, 2021, and 2022 because I want to illustrate that while. The revenues are down compared to the 2021 estimate. I think that was an anomaly. They're still higher than the December 2020 estimate. So let's just consider the December 21 estimate an anomaly. Okay. Even without that, the estimate in the last estimate in December 2022 is higher than the December 20 estimate. So that's good. That means more money is going to flow through the program open space formula to the programs that are. Um, that benefit from the transfer tax. The other thing to point out here is that one of the things that's helping the 2024 budget is the roughly $120 million over attainment in fiscal 2022 because the estimate was so much lower than actual. And the way the state manages that is any under or over attainment is then taken up in the not the next year, but the following year after that. So the 2022 over, uh, over, underestimate, excuse me, of 120.22 million is then applied to 2024. We do note, however, that current estimates would portend an under attainment in fiscal 2025. And obviously, we'll have to wait until the final revenues come in to know how much that under attainment might be or whether that even materializes if the, if the collections um, change. I'm not going to cover page 26, 28, excuse me, that just gives you an allocation of where the um, transfer tax across the various programs of the benefit from the program open space formula. The next section on page 30 deals with the infrastructure, and infrastructure Act. And it shows that, you know, the state's expected to receive about $880 million in MDE um, for to enhance the drinking and water quality programs. Both those programs are established programs, and those programs alone will be enhanced. But the infrastructure bill also includes some new components, um, the clean water state revolving, um, revolving funds that address the emerging contaminants, um, the drinking water revolving funds, we'll learn from addressing emerging contaminants, um, as, as well as the Lead, lead service line replacement. So there are new program initiatives with the federal IIJ money. We did begin to receive that money in FY22 in, in a supplemental budget um, last March. So these funds have begun to flow. And this reflects the fiscal out, expected fis federal fiscal year and may not coincide with the state fiscal year when you see this. This does not include roughly $100 million we expect to receive from IIJ to continue to enhance the state's broad, broadband network over and above what we've um, gotten in the ARPA funds. And then lastly, because uh, I'm not going to cover the appendices, obviously, in the interest of time, lastly, in the housing section, again, like any, anywhere else, you're seeing a substantial reduction relative to last year, more funding in, than was proposed, however, in last year's plan. And again, the biggest thing that's affecting this is the ARPA funding that had flowed through um, predominantly for broadband and, and through the rental housing um, programs for rental housing assistance. Um, and those things have expired um, and are not expected to, to support the, the budget. And with that, I'll take any questions. If there are any. Thank you very much, Mr. Klein, for the analysis. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Klein? Seeing none, thank you very much. We shall move on to the Department of Information Technology and our budget analyst is Mr. Patrick Frank. Uh, 
okay, the Department of Information Technology budget. As um, Matt Klein, I will not cover every page, but if there's any questions you have about the pages that I don't cover, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, cover page, I think the takeaway from this first page is that the state has spent almost $400 million over the last 20 years for this project. It is, a, um, it is an ongoing project, and good news later is it's, it's almost done. Um, but there still are improvements that we're finding that need to be done. I'll move on to page three now. The project is a 700 megahertz um, radio system that is statewide. It um, is also called Maryland First, and it is for first responders. And it um, covers, like I said, the whole state and even the other state um, uh, organizations and that also participate in this. As you can see from the map here on page one, is the, how, the, how this project was phased in. Early on, there was a year or two between um, phases becoming going online, but unfortunately, this last phase of fiscal 2023 has taken a, a four years since the, the prior phase. A good reason, part of that is the technology for the backhaul. They're moving from the old, an old P1 technology to an Ethernet technology, which has a lot more bandwidth um, and has and um, it's oftentimes um, more reliable than microwave and some of these other things. The problem was that the first try from the vendor didn't quite work, and so they had to redesign and, and, and do, it, do it a second time, essentially. And so that has taken quite a bit longer than was anticipated. I am told now that April 2023 it should be going live. It, it, the testing is going well now for this. Um, I've already talked about Ethernet, so I'll go on page two. What needs to be done now that the system is done, they are finding that there are places where the, the, the coverage isn't as good as they, as they would like it to be. And so there's a schedule that's been made, and you can see on page uh, five, exhibit two, that shows the towers that are going to be replaced or, or added in some cases. And, um, and so what... What's happening here essentially is it's filling in those, those, those spaces. This list is pretty stable. I mean, some things do get moved around, but I've seen this list for a couple of years now, and I recognize a lot of the, the, the towers. Um, it's, uh, page six, exhibit three, shows um, the CIP from last year and what the spending is in the CIP this year. Uh, the line is last year's CIP. Last year, the project in the out years was essentially only the towers that, we, that I mentioned in the last exhibit. Um, what this is adding is some things that they had talked about in the past about needing to be improved, but um, but now finally do get it in the, in the CIP. Um, the, the red, the, the blue that you see there is the that those are the towers. The red is um, basically fiber for the backhaul. The backhaul, the way to think of the backhaul is, is there's the tower. It's kind of the, the network that it goes on to, and between the tower and network, it, it, it's connected by what's called backhaul. Um, and um, there's some places where that needs to be improved and hardened, and so um, that is being done. A lot of that will be done, through, like I said, through fiber, and there could be some other benefits, say, for rural broadband and stuff. So that once the fiber is built, it can be used for more than just this system. Also, that what they'll be doing is there are 22 different if you will, areas in which these that have a, each has a control site, and um, they're going to put some redundancy in those control sites so that if something happens to one, that there is some, some extra. Um, the, 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 as with everything, generally the, what they do is when they find these things, they look at what kind of is kind of what gets the most traffic and is most important and what is least expensive to do. And so those kinds of, those things float to the top of the list for this project, and, and that's how um, these, the, the, they, they prioritize, because they, they know they're not going to get the full amount to do everything all at once. And, and so, and finally, the, a, a, the third group there on top of that is um, there's some problems with in, in building um, communication, and so, for some, uh, uh, quite a few key uh, buildings, public buildings throughout the state, they will add some some little nodes and stuff so that when you're in the building, it kind of amplifies it so it can get on the system. And I will now skip on. Okay, page eight is an, just one issue, I think, that it's important, as Matt Klein was just talking about this. The state doesn't always have a, a great um, maintenance um, record. And it's really important for this system to, to be maintained properly, and um, we're encouraging the department to maintain it properly. Finally, on page 10 is uh, the, the operating impact statement, which people often don't talk about, but in this case, I do want to say that um, 
the system is he has four people that do the 24/7 work of managing it and answering calls and whenever at whatever time of day or night and um, especially when the new phase five becomes operational there may be a time to evaluate if additional staff is necessary. At this point, it seems like it's going well, but, you know, it's, it's, it's getting bigger, and so and so that may be something that may happen in the future. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks and answer questions. Now, questions from members of the committee for Mr. Frank. I'll now call up the Secretary for the Department of Information Technology, Secretary Katie Savage. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Katie Savage. I'm the Acting Secretary of the Maryland Department of Information Technology. I'm joined today by Norm Fairley, our Chief of Public Safety Communications. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to provide a testimony to this committee. I would also like to thank Patrick Frank, our DLS Analyst, for his continued efforts and support. Uh, the, the Department of Information Technology has one capital project to review, and the, um, as mentioned, is the Maryland First Statewide Public Safety and Communication System. Maryland First was designed to support law enforcement officials, emergency medical personnel, firefighters, emergency management, as well as regional and federal agency partners reliably and, safety, and safely during day to day operations, emergencies, and planned and unplanned events. Each month, the Maryland First System averages over 2.5 million push talks from radio user transmissions. Additionally, the system now supports over 83,000 members of the Maryland public safety community, over 100 different state agencies, county, federal, and neighboring state jurisdictions. All Maryland counties, Baltimore City, Annapolis, and Ocean City are either primary or interoperable users of the system. Maryland First continues to grow and expands its adoption within the public safety community, meeting the goal of interoperable, mission critical voice communication throughout the state. In the short time that I've been Secretary at Do It, I've been very impressed by the professionalism and the scale at which the Maryland First project performs. I look forward to working with Norm and his team on the exciting and essential work ahead. Don't want to take up any more of your time, so we will we provide written testimony, and we'll be happy happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Any questions from the committee? Delegate Price. Thank you. They were mentioning maintenance. Is there a maintenance contract with um, Motorola? Y yes, sir. We, we have a well, we have a maintenance contract, and part of that maintenance contract is what's called an, an SUA, a System Upgrade Assurance Program so that every two years it goes through an upgrade of, of software and hardware. The theory being that you never have to do, you know, 15 years from now, we won't have to do a forklift replacement of the entire system. We just constantly keep it upgraded so, it, upgraded so it's always, you know, at the, at the latest technology. Okay. If you have any questions from members of the committee, thank you very much, Madam Secretary, for being here. Next, we move on to the Maryland State Library Agency. Presented by the budget analyst, Laura Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I'm Laura Hyde for the Capital Analyst for the Maryland State Library Agency. We're starting on page one, just looking at the top CIP. You can see that um, the mandated amount for the library agency per Chapter 27 of 2021 is $7.5 million in this budget in fiscal 24. The budget is introduced has um, an additional $4.1 million added to this budget. You can turn to page two under updates. Um, the library agency received federal stimulus funds for broadband, and of that amount, 648000 was distributed to counties for infrastructure improvement. Even though MSLA doesn't track local broadband means or programs expenditures separately, they do participate in a number of the broadband initiatives in the state. So um, DLS just suggested that MSLA comment on the need for additional capital improvement related to broadband. If you look at the top of page three, this is Exhibit 1. This is the project list. As I said before, 
the library funding and the governor's budget is introduced is um, a total of $11.6 million with $7.5 million as mandated in Chapter 27, and then an additional $4.1 million allocated to previously funded projects to support additional construction costs from higher than anticipated construction inflation. There are three new projects in this budget. Um, these are funded with the base amount. There's a new Glen Burnie Library in Anne Arundel County that receives $200,000. The Ruth Enlow Library in Garrett receives $513,000. And then the Worcester County Library receives $2.2 million. There are also continuing projects in this budget. The Baltimore Catonsville Library renovation is supplementally funded at $2.4 million. The Calvert Twin Beaches Library gets supplemental funding for $854,000. The Caroline Denton Library renovation gets base funding for $467,000. The Frederick New Middletown Library gets supplemental funding for $563,000. Then there's the Hartford Bell Air Library renovation that gets base funding for $3.6 million. The Prince George's Baden Library relocation and renovation gets supplemental funding for $519,000. And Talbot St. Michael's Library gets base funding for $240,000. There's 12.5 mil, uh, million in future requests in this budget, and the total for fiscal 24, though, is 11.5 million dollars. If you please turn uh, to the back, it's on page 16. This is Exhibit 2. So, since fiscal 19, total requests for library capital funds have averaged approximately 9.6 million dollars per year, ranging from 7.6 million to 11.2 million dollars per year, and an average shortfall of $3.2 million from the alliance. This exhibit shows that a total of $96.3 million in actual and allocated funds for library capital programs since 2008. During that time period, Hartford counties received the largest share of total allocations, followed by Baltimore, Montgomery, Frederick, and Allegheny. And for the first time in fiscal 24, Garrett County receives funds, um, what I said previously, $513,000. This ends my presentation, and I stand for questions. This is high for the presentation. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, the next will call up from the Maryland State Library Agency, State Librarian Irene Padilla. Please come up. And also, Donna Liberto. Thank you very much for being here today. Please proceed. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I also wanted to introduce Dr. Tamar Sarnoff, who is a member of my staff. She's director of the Public Libraries division and um, are very supportive of this program as well. Um, we do have some members of the audience who represent libraries, or they were here. Maybe they've, they've moved on, but uh, we do have a lot of interest in this program across the state, and I know that you've received quite a few number, uh, quite a few letters of support for the program. So we're here in support of our budget, $7.5 million, as well as supplemental funding of four million fifty thousand dollars for the county public library grants program and we're so delighted on that about that amount um, it's far more than we anticipated but certainly it's all very much needed and we want to thank you for your ongoing commitment since the implementation of the program in 2008 your mandate to provide five million dollars a year and now 7.5 million dollars a year in capital funds has helped 23 of the state's 24 library systems improve one or more of their library buildings. This year, for the first time in the history of the program, we were recommending a project in Garrett County, bringing the total to 24 and reaching every single library jurisdiction in Maryland. Additionally, your investment has been matched by local funds of approximately $370 million more than four times the amount of the state's investment, which is really one of the major points when they established this program is they wanted to make sure that the local jurisdictions were able to participate. You have our written testimony, and Laura Hyde's very thorough analysis provides an excellent description of the program. So I won't go into detail about the proposed projects or the 19 beautiful new libraries that have opened because of this program. However, I especially want to express our gratitude for your recognition of the need to increase the funding for the program in 2023. And while the Library Capital Grant Program was flat-funded, costs for constructions have, construction have soared, 
and we uh, really look forward to continuing to move on. As the analyst points out, since fiscal 2020, total requests for library capital funds have averaged approximately $9.3 million per year, with an average shortfall of $2.3 million from the allowance. The governor's budget is introduced as a total of $12.5 million in future spending for the excuse me, for the projects funded in fiscal 2024. This amount exceeds the mandated grant allowance by $5 million, as was pointed out. In addition to the current projects, the State Library is aware of at least three new construction projects and a growing number of major renovation and expansion projects that will request funding in 2025. And the only way the agency can accommodate these requests is through additional supplemental funding for the program, another cre increase in the mandate, or through the enactment of current pendant, pending legislation. Senate Bill 501, the Aging Infrastructure Capital Improvement Grant Program, would authorize an additional $40 million annually over the next six years for library capital projects above the existing library capital grant program. The only alternative is to stall the completion of current projects and wait to fund any new projects. However, with your ongoing support of Maryland Libraries and your continued responsiveness to our needs and those of our communities, we are very optimistic and look forward to answering any questions you have today. Thank you very much, Ms. Padilla. Are there any questions for our state librarian? Vice Chairman Jazz Lewis. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you have a lot of avid readers in this room. I actually enjoyed this past weekend doing story time with a, a number of um, children at the Glenarden Library that, um, uh, in my district. Um, I just had a question, and I know you said you can get into too many details on some of the specific projects, but I was just noting the size of the library relocation for Greater uh, Baden area in the southern part of Prince George's County. Um, one, I'm glad that it's, you know, um, being rebuilt, uh, but I was just wondering that size, I and mean, it seems kind of small. Um, is there any detail there? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you that when I first saw those numbers, I thought it might be undersized. Um, but let me check in with Prince George's County Library System and see what their thoughts are, because right now, off the top of my head, I can't picture the other co-located branches in that area. So they may have other means by which they want to serve those folks who live in there, that area. Also, they are acquiring a new uh, state-of-the-art uh, bookmobile that they're going to be using in the county. So I, I, what I need to do is find out more information for you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? And Donna Liberto? Did you have any? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, that concludes the he hearing for the Maryland State Library Association. We can see we'll move on next to Historic St. Mary's Commission and Morgan Smith presenting the analysis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Logan Smith, and I'll be presenting the capital budget analysis for Historic St. Mary's City Commission today. Um, starting on page one, you will see a capital budget summary of the state-owned um, CIP projects for uh, Historic St. Mary's City Commission. Um, the CIP for this year includes five projects, two are ongoing and have had prior state funding, and those are the uh, site improvement projects and the Leonard Calvert House exhibit. There are three new projects in the CIP, and those include the Chapel Interpretive Exhibit, the Education Center and Artisan Center, and the Collection Storage and Maintenance Facility. Um, we're going to skip to um, page three. Page three starts the um, discussion of each of these projects, and I'll just walk through them very um, briefly. The site improvement project happening at St. Mary's, um, like I said, has been um, previously funded in this fiscal year, there is a million dollars set aside for site improvements um, across the um, commission. And then in the out years, there is a million dollars per year set aside for site improvement. 
Um, the only item that I want to point out for this is that there is bold print towards the end of the page. Um, due to difficulty in obtaining accurate and up-to-date information, DLS recommends the adoption of committee narratives to require a historic St. Mary City to submit an annual report outlining the use of funds under the site improvement project and a status update for each site upgrade funded. This is because year to year they have small site improvement projects that are funded under this massive site improvement umbrella, um, and DLS just wants information on how those individual projects move along from year to year. Jumping to page four, uh, the Leonard Calvert House exhibit, again, has also been previously funded. Um, the Calvert House aims to increase knowledge um, in historic St. Mary's City um, and build connections between Maryland's founding and where we're at now. Um, the indoor exhibit um, space at the house will showcase artifacts and provide educational programming um, about the, um, the house itself. Uh, and in fiscal 2024, 784 um, thousand dollars is included in geo bonds um, for this purpose. And um, this is primarily for archaeological work that will be done at the site. Moving to page five begins the discussion on out-year program state-owned projects, the first of which is the Education Center and Artisan Center Renovation and Systems Upgrade. Um, this project will provide needed alterations to an existing building, um, and that is where the current visitor center is located. The structure will be repurposed into an educational complex, um, and um, it will be then replaced by the Maryland Heritage Interpretive Center, which I'm sure you've heard about in past years. Um, this will also upgrade adjacent storage facility, um, and it will create um, some space for educational programming, um, both for local school children and then also, in addition, the uh, Maryland, the uh, St. Mary's College of Maryland Museum Study students will also be able to use this space moving forward. Um, the change that is important to note for this project is that um, while the schedule to fund initial design remains unchanged and is scheduled for 2025, um, the commencement of construction has been deferred from fiscal 2026 to 2027. Moving on to page six, there is a project uh, titled Collection Storage and Maintenance Facility. Um, this project will construct a two-floor facility that supports research and collections in the facilities maintenance departments at Historic St. Mary City Commission. And uh, its primary use will be providing additional storage for excavation materials from the archaeological digs that are happening at the commission. Um, and it will also have research space, staff offices, a break room, et cetera. Um, funding has been added in fiscal 2027 to begin design for this project. Um, and um, there is not funding allocated in 2028 yet. Moving on to page seven, and this is the last page. Um, this project is called the Chapel Interpretive Exhibit. Um, this will establish a new interpretive exhibit at Historic St. Mary's City Commission, um, which is adjacent to the reconstructed brick chapel of 1667. Um, and the exhibit will enable the museum to provide education and display artifacts that are related to the site. Um, and the site is notorious for symbolizing the religious tolerance of Maryland back in 1667. Um, so the project is going to require archaeological investigation, lab work, and, and the like before design begins. And that is what is funded in um, fiscal 2028. Um, and with that, uh, aside from the bold language, DLS recommends the um, approval of the funding for uh, the two ongoing projects, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith, for the analysis. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Ms. Smith on the analysis? Thank you very much. Today we have joining us the Executive Director, Regina M. Faden. Please come up. Uh, my name is Regina Fodden, and I have the uh, privilege of serving as the Executive Director of Historic St. Mary's City Commission. With me are my colleagues, Joe Pangas, uh, Director of Facilities and Grounds, and Doug Hunter, our Director of Finance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. 
We are grateful for Analyst Morgan Smith's uh, keen analysis. You have our written testimony, so we'll not review that. But we do want to share some of the great things happening at St. Mary's City uh, at this time. So in 2021, the Commission approved a new master plan that lays out a vision for historic St. Mary's City to become a premier historical site like Jamestown in Colonial Williamsburg as we prepare for the commemoration of our state's funding, our funding, excuse me, in 2034. We are grateful for the support of our governor and his administration, the Maryland General Assembly, in particular our local legislators, Senator Jack Bailey and Delegate Brian Crosby, whose unflagging enthusiasm will help us realize this vision. We are grateful for the support and hard work put forth on our behalf by the colleagues at DBM to identify projects that will improve the visitor experience and for DGS who lend their experience and expertise and professionalism to manage these projects. To date, at St. Mary's City, we have identified over 300 archaeological sites which have yielded evidence of people living along the shores of St. Mary's River as long as 10,000 years ago. The discovery and excavation of the 1634 fort has revealed artifacts that tell the story of Maryland's founding. Over the coming years, our research will reveal as yet unknown stories about the interaction among people from indigenous communities, from Africa, and Europeans who came to colonize the site during the 17th century and concepts of race, freedom, and civil rights were fluid, yet to be defined by culture and law. The newly constructed tall ship, the Maryland Dove, will sail to Port Sokol along the Chesapeake Bay this year to educate and delight those who might not otherwise be able to experience boarding the ship. The construction of our new visitor center, as Morgan mentioned, the Maryland Heritage Interpretive Center, is the single largest capital project in the history of the Commission, and it has broken ground and we look forward to welcoming you all to its grand opening in 2024. We appreciate our partners at St. Mary's College of Maryland for serving as managers on this very important project. These are exciting times at Historic St. Mary's City. We thank you for your interest and support. We concur with the recommendation and are available for questions. Thank you very much, Executive Director Fodden. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Executive Director? Dory Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up. appreciate you concurred with the recommendation about the report related to the lack of information DLS was getting, but do you just want to explain a little bit why there was an issue? Um, like I said, we, we apologize for any confusion with Morgan. She did request information, and I think um, we are in the process with multiple projects, and we'll get her that report. Like I said, um, I think we were uh, in process um, of, um, like I said, answering that. <laughs> Capital eligibility and, and so we have two projects in 2024. Uh, at least, excuse me, from um, last fiscal year, and then we have multiple projects this year that were approved in the fall. So I said we'll we'll be better with responding in the future. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Doug Coleman, Doug Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just out of curiosity, you may not have the answer. Um, is there any requirement for students in Maryland in any particular age group to visit the site? There is no requirement. Um, okay. Typically, the, the fourth grade is when students come down. Um, it is not required. We've looked into that. <laughs> if we could do that. But um, it is certainly encouraged. And we do get students from all of Southern Maryland and then mostly um, Montgomery County mm -hmm. and then Baltimore County and Baltimore City. Okay. Just curious because I grew up. Every first grader in Virginia has a good genes that I recall, so that's right. That was great. <laughs> Thank you, Doug Smith. Are there any other questions from members of the committee for Executive Director Fodden? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Great day. Next, we'll move on to Baltimore City Community College. The analysis will be provided by Samuel Quist. Uh, thank you, our Chair and members of the subcommittee. Uh, the Baltimore City Community College uh, capital budget um, includes funding for two projects. Um, there are also two additional projects planned for future years that are shown in the chart on page one of the analysis. Uh, projects planned for fiscal 2024 funding include the 
uh, Library Learning Commons Renovation and Addition Project, as well as funding for the college's uh, Deferred Maintenance uh, Program. I'd like to point out on page two in the updates section, there's also a discussion about funds that were included in the operating budget in fiscal 2022 to provide uh, funding for the demolition of the Bard building in downtown Baltimore City. Um, the analysis discusses that DGS has procured a design contract and is working on a construction contract um, to commence the demolition in uh, later in this calendar year. Um, the discussion of the first project in FY24, the Learning Commons Renovation and Addition, begins on page four of the analysis. There is a total of 1.1 million in geo bond funding uh, to complete the design phase of this project. Uh, the project will renovate the existing um, library on BCCC's main campus and build an addition uh, to create a new Learning Commons facility. The renovations will place outdated building systems and reconfigure the space layout uh, for study space and other programming. Uh, design is currently scheduled to begin in April of 2023 uh, for the project and construction in December of 2024. The second project, the Deferred Maintenance Program, uh, begins on page six. Um, some of my other colleagues uh, spoke about deferred maintenance at other state facilities. The, uh, this project is providing funding for deferred maintenance at BCCC. Uh, the eight million, which is included in the budget this year, is the third year of state support for this initiative and brings the total funding amount to, uh, sorry, 22.5 million over the three year period. The eight million included in the fiscal 2024 capital budget includes four million in geo bond funding and four million in PAYGO special funds from the state's uh, fiscal responsibility fund. And then uh, there's also programmed in the CIP four million annually for this initiative in future years through fiscal 2028. Um, exhibit one on page seven, um, is showing a breakdown of the categories of the individual deferred maintenance projects that funding has been either used for or planned for use um, of the funding that was previously allocated. Um, and exhibit number two on page eight shows a similar breakdown uh, for the planned funding in fiscal 2024 and other projects prioritized uh, for future uh, funding use. I think uh, with that, I will conclude and I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Priest, for the presentation. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, we have joining us today from Florida City Community College, President Deborah L. McCurdy. Also, we have Catherine Zoraig. Good evening, Madam President. Mr. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Vice Chairman as well. You can hear me. Thank you. Uh, we are very pleased to be here um, on a late uh, Wednesday afternoon. And uh, for the record, I am Deborah McCurdy, President of Baltimore City Community College. I'm joined by uh, Mr. Michael Thomas. He's the Vice President for continuing education workforce and overseas facilities area, as well as Ms. Kate Zerlich, uh, the Assistant Vice President for Facilities. Uh, we're also thanking uh, our DLS analyst, Sam Quist, along with my, Michael Matthew Klein for their support as well. Uh, thank you as well for allowing us to provide this brief testimony in support of the Governor's 2024 budget recommendations for Baltimore City Community College including the eight million in deferred maintenance and the 1.1 to continue the design of the learning commons sorely needed uh, renovation. The governor's budget does demonstrate Maryland's commitment to Baltimore City Community College and the students who we serve coming 
basically from Baltimore City Schools as well as surrounding areas. What you have in your packet as well are information that talks about um, where we are with our facilities. Uh, going back to 1971, we probably have some of the older facilities among Maryland's other community colleges as well. When we couple all of this with the age of the facilities, uh, the lack of routine funding that the college has uh, not had, uh, the safety upgrades, uh, all of this is impacting uh, most of our building systems, many of which um, have uh, begun to fail. Good news, we are working with the Department of General Services to uh, really diminish the deferred maintenance load on the college as well. In that certainly is going to help tremendously as we look at the additional funding for 2024. Uh, we are committed to the city of Baltimore and certainly to the students um, who we serve. As far as DLS recommendations uh, in your packet on page two, uh, we do concur with the recommendations to adopt the governor's uh, budget for the $8 million in deferred maintenance and the $1.1 million for the design of the Learning Commons renovation and addition. Also in your packet, and our analyst has, has briefly referred to several, you'll see the nursing project to renovate and expand the 1977 building to provide our nursing programs with more modern hospital simulation to certainly serve the ever-growing need of health care in this community as well. The current building is experiencing system failures and not large enough to hold the capacity of students who show the interest. Um, other needs that you're seeing in the pack of certainly our facilities, a building as well that um, has to be improved. They're sitting in a trailer, but for planning purposes, other technical work that has to be done, um, looking in that direction. You'll see a wellness center. That is a collaboration between academic affairs and student affairs. And so when we look at recreation and we look at the physical therapy curricula, this is a building that is going to respond. It also responds to our student needs. Outside of the bricks and mortar, classrooms and offices, uh, there is no place for students to go um, to have some level of socialization. And so this facility is designated for that as we look at incorporating physical therapy, basketball, racquetball, fitness space, running tracks. Um, it only brings us to where other two-year institutions are. Two quick points. I um, want to thank you for approving the use of the construction contingency funding for the Loop Road. This is a huge, going to make a huge difference for the college. Many of you have been on the college, and so you know currently there's one way into that campus. If we have an emergency now, we had emergency vehicles coming onto the campus, they would literally block the arteries to get to some of the parking lots, which would, again, uh, ensure that people would be trapped on the campus. And we saw that back in 2014-15 with some emergencies. People couldn't get off the campus. This will allow for that second entrance, and this is due to come into fruition in uh, the coming um, uh, months, July 2023, so we're very grateful for this funding. And last, uh, to thank you again for the support of the Bard Building Demolition Project that's going out for bid next month. We expect to see scheduled completion in June of 2024. So the Bard Building, for those of you who uh, may not be as familiar, they're on Lombard Street. It's over 100,000 square feet. The college long vacated that premise. It was filled with offices and other programs. Um, it is not livable, and we will be demolishing that and looking to reimagine how we will redevelop this site for innovation um, in college programming. Let me conclude and thank Chairman uh, Chang and Vice Chairman Lewis, the Budget Subcommittee as well, and invite all of you to visit. Baltimore City Community College to discuss and see firsthand the things that exist at Baltimore City Community College. I'll end my comments and uh, invite any questions. Thank you very much, President McCurdy, for your presentation. Are there any questions from members of the committee for President McCurdy? Seeing none, that ends the hearing for Baltimore City Community College, and that ends the budget hearing for today. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much.